easier for me. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming, and thank you to ODI um, for setting this up. Um, I want to start not by answering Simon questions, but uh, Simon's questions, but by moving um, back a little bit to to an overview to explain why, at least in my mind, we've taken the angle of approach um, that we have. Um, the world is changing in lots of ways. We all know that. The recession, I think, has brought home. Uh, it may have accelerated the changes, but it has certainly accelerated the perception of change, the understanding and awareness of, of change uh, in the global power system. And we see um, new powerful actors emerging with, with new roles. And looking at the humanitarian issues, the question of the humanitarian caseload, um, Simon organized a sort of straw poll amongst the Global Agenda Council um, back in the summer of 2008. And I think actually to begin with, the first reaction was yes, the, um, the humanitarian caseload is probably rising. It's probably going to rise. We can see that, especially climate change. Um, the second reaction, later when we got together on the telephone and when we got together in um, uh, the actual face-to-face -face meetings was the humanitarian caseload is rising and it's likely to rise quite sharply. And the reason for that is not only climate change but it's also the effects of the economic recession. So that we saw a, uh, an increase in the caseload sort of sharpening up in the next three to five years through knock-on effects out of what has been happening in the last year and a half. Plus the longer term trends that we had seen anyway. Um, I don't think one needs to go into very much detail about it, but of course with climate you have the extreme weather events, but you also have, as well as um, sudden shock, you have slow onset changes that by affecting, for example, water supply, affect food security and also livelihood security, affect the whether various areas are actually in any practical sense <coughs> habitable anymore and you start to get people moving and the movement of people itself and I'm not talking about movement from the poor global south to the rich global north I'm talking about much more short-range movements it might even be hard to distinguish from the general pattern of urbanization but the movement of people is itself um, a, a bearer if not a cause of, of problems uh, which can include conflict problems when you add to that uh, especially developing countries facing a triple hit out of the recession of um, hitting their exports, hitting investment, and above all, hitting labor remittances. The kind of multiple pressures coming upon um, countries where perhaps armed conflicts have been handled, have been managed, but the conflict issues have not been resolved, where it's a question more of suppressing conflict than actually of resolving the issues. You see societies with a large number of weak points in them. And when those weak points are stressed, then humanitarian disaster and crisis uh, comes out uh, as a result. And I think that in some ways, for the kind of arguments that we, we were making in this um, document and that we were making in the, the meetings which led into it, Haiti is almost a, um, an emblematic case because there is a country which everybody knows sits on an earthquake fault and in a hurricane zone. And the last really serious uh, disaster in Haiti was, was hurricane caused, and this one is earthquake caused, and it's uh, beyond human comprehension how horrible it is, and yet actually it was all known about. So the risk was, was visible and had even been experienced, but the preparation, the, the, the capacity um, was, was extremely weak. So. How do you envisage a society generating the capacity to develop resilience, especially resilience as far as slow onset uh, changes are concerned, but also the resilience to deal with the, the vulnerabilities which are going to be left over anyway? I mean, any country, um, however rich and however well prepared, can, will still have residual vulnerabilities. My, um, my daughter uh, used to work um, on temporary contracts in, in Norwich. She's now 
on permanent contracts, you'll be happy to know, so I'll pass <laughs> on your good wishes. And one of them was in the town hall. And she was in the town hall uh, working for, I suppose it's the county council, um, at the time when the North Sea surged, uh, the highest recorded surge, which I think was in the end of November 2007. And it's the biggest one since the floods of the early 1950s. And the floods of the early 1950s, uh, hundreds of thousands of people made homeless, some hundreds killed. It was even worse in, in the Netherlands. And so, you know, what has happened since then in this country that we all like to think of as being, you know, wholly dysfunctional and hopeless and useless? Well, I thought, you know, I'll go right to the person who must know. I'll ask my daughter. Because she was in the Situation Room during this, on temporary contract. And she had the key responsibility, of course, which was making tea. <laughs> and I asked what happened. And she said, well, it was really great because every hour... The, every, the phones rang, and everybody ran to the phones, and they checked on their computers, and they checked on their notebooks, and they checked on little scraps of paper, and they shouted incomprehensible things to each other. And then nothing happened. And they went away, and they got out the newspaper. They said, Rebecca, could you make us another cup of tea? <laughs> and so on. And she made them another cup of tea. And the, the, an hour later, on the hour, through came a phone call. I mean, what, what was happening was that the water levels were being uh, registered as they rose. And they were rising, in a sense, according to plan, on target. Nothing additional need to be, needed to be done. There was actually a meeting of the Cabinet Emergency Committee that morning, which, um, well, you know, what's the opposite of convening? It disbanded. It <laughs> disappeared after about 20 minutes, deciding there was nothing that they could do. So that was, that was resilience. Now, if the floodwaters had risen higher, if the surge had been even more uh, than that, then there would have been a residual vulnerability would have been um, revealed. And the UK then would have sent army, it would have sent fire brigade, it would have sent police, it would have sent volunteers, things would have been organized, set up, there's a structure for doing it. But what they could see was that that was not going to be needed. Now, how do you, in talking about a country like the Philippines, which I take as an example because it is absolutely in the front line for climate change, uh, it has about 7,000 islands. It has, an it has a, uh, a national border, which is the, about the same as the circumference of the world. It's about the same as the equator. Um, factoid for you to take away and, and recall. Um, the pattern of typhoons has changed. And you saw the effects of that, if you were watching the news uh, last November, as, the, as Manila flooded. And metropolitan Manila, which doesn't usually get hit by floods from the typhoons, was really seriously hit. So not even a country like Haiti that one might be talking about, but with a country like the Philippines, how could it strengthen its resilience and narrow down the residual vulnerabilities and then also have the capacity with which to face the residual vulnerabilities? And what we've, where we've got to in our discussion is to say that there are essentially three sets of actors whom we're looking at here. There are the government world actors, there is the private sector actors who have been to one side for a long period and are slowly edging more in and should be edged much more and much more forcefully into the picture. And there is the non-governmental, the NGOs, which should not be left to one side. And each set of actors brings a different capacity and quality to the table. Um, the governments have, uh, first of all, they have networks, international networks, intergovernmental networks, which are crucially important. That's the mode in which um, relationships happen. They have access to resources on an unparalleled scale and in many cases they have a legitimacy uh, which is necessary in order to be mobilizing a social, social activity in, for example, the development of resilience and the narrowing of vulnerability. The private sector will tend to have very sharp, you could almost call them deep rather than broad, capacity and knowledge and expertise and an ability to mobilize that very quickly if there is need and opportunity available to do so. And not all of that mobilization of resources is done purely on the basis of what's in it for us. I think that the, some of the dialogues which have been happening have shown that um, for, for a, a balance of different <coughs> motives, for a balance of different reasons, private sector actors can actually get engaged on the same sort of simple humanitarian imperative basis as other actors can. And the NGOs bring 
their own kind of mobilization capacity, their own kind of social networks, and especially can bring local knowledge and local participation into the frame. And if you imagine trying to do these kinds of things that I'm talking about at a very local level, and imagine it being done by government and private sector, in the Philippines and in many other countries, you're going to get a pretty dusty answer at that point. Uh, the, the government, the state of the Philippines is not um, totally without legitimacy, but the current government is almost totally without legitimacy. Uh, there is a very strong discourse <coughs> which sees the role of the private sector, especially the international private sector, as crude, exploitative, narrow, ruthless. And it will, unless there is a local NGO and a local political community as well involved into activities, then they will lack legitimacy. So, three sectors of actors. Also, I think it's crucial to talk about the different levels of activity. Uh, one of the things which I think is fundamental is to understand the building of resilience and the narrowing of vulnerability as something which primarily and initially happens at the local level. And by local, I don't mean what uh, people from the rich north often mean when they say local. Local actors often turn out to be sort of actors in, uh, in the national capital. I mean local, local. So in the provinces, in villages, in towns, that is where the real action will happen. That's where the real resilience, that's where information will be given, warnings which can be trusted, and people will move and react because they receive warnings. That's where plans can be made which can include the interests of ordinary people and where people will be trusting that their interests are being included because they know within their broader networks the people who are and the, the groups who are doing the organizing. But that local level activity being carried out by local NGOs, local government, and local businesses, and as Simon said, uh, chambers of commerce and business clubs, business associations as, as part of that, that local level activity is not going to mean very much unless it's got the backing of a national level coordination. And that coordination will be both about action, it'll be about policy, it'll be <coughs> about priorities, it'll be about money, and above all, it'll be about logistics, about actually getting resources that are required to the place where they are needed, whether that is prevention or response. And none of that, or not all of that, is going to be possible simply on the basis of national level activity. Partly because many governments will simply lack the resources, both expertise but also money, to see things through. And secondly, because there's numerous cases and places where the, um, where the problems that we're talking about cross borders. And where those uh, problems cross borders, then you need a regional framework as well of, of activity. The candidate area that we have looked at. It hasn't been sort of by coincidence that I've been mentioning the Philippines. Uh, the South Southeast Asia as a whole is completely in the front line of climate change. We were, Simon, I think it was you who were talking to catastrophic risk people. In, that's, that's not to say people who take catastrophic risks, but ones who study <laughs> catastrophic risks, uh, at the last meeting of the Global Agenda Council. And they were saying some really hairy things like, uh, you know, as for, as for the Mekong Delta, forget it. Um, so what will happen to Vietnamese rice exports? Well, Vietnamese rice will no longer be exported. Um, they also had some figure about what was happening in Indonesia. The number of people who live within X miles of the coast was 80% of the population. So in Southeast Asia has, is on the front line of risk. It also has, of course, um, economically quite well developed developed societies, strong businesses, um, different kinds of government of different degrees of participation, inclusion, exclusion, and legitimacy. And in ASEAN, a, a regional organization which is beginning to try to um, ramp up its activities a bit and increase its presence and its profile and its efficiency and wants to engage in this kind of issue. So what we are looking to do is to be selling this idea in that context. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks both.